and hopefully Jemina, my colleague, will be here momentarily and can slip into the moderator seat, but we'll go ahead and get started. My name's Andrew Wilder. I'm the Vice President of the uh, Asia Center here at USIP, and so I'd like to welcome you all here, especially first-time visitors. I see many familiar faces as well. For those of you who are new, uh, uh, USIP is an independent national institution, uh, you know, dedicated to the prop proposition that peace is possible, it's practical, and it's essential for our national security. Um, we like to think of ourselves as a think and do tank. Uh, we support analytical work and policy relevant analysis, um, but we also support programs in countries um, around the world. And we've been active in Pakistan for more than a decade, supporting programs there around the broad theme of trying to create uh, uh, greater tolerance of diversity, as we think that's a major driver of conflict, not only in Pakistan, but around the world these days. Um, and so that's been a theme uh, of a lot of our programmatic efforts in Pakistan. Um, but we've also been working on the issue of um, uh, preventing electoral violence. Elections has been, a, we worked on a program in the 2013 elections, but also for this round of elections, um, we supported some analytical work, um, including on topics we'll be hearing more on today on preventing electoral violence, as well as women's participation in elections, um, but we, and then supporting other programmatic efforts as well. Um, uh, this topic is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, 25 years ago, I was sitting in Lahore doing research on, for my dissertation on uh, voting behavior in the Punjab. Um, uh, my book never became a bestseller, but uh, it's nevertheless still very interesting and relevant, so please do, do read it. Um, uh, but it's great today to welcome uh, many individuals who I think are representing a new generation of scholars on Pakistan. And so it's great to welcome all of you today. Thank you for coming. Um, and I think without taking more time myself, I'm going to turn it over to Colin, uh, who will start moderating the first panel uh, in Jemina's absence. And with that, over to you, Colin. Sure. Um, so again, thanks everybody for joining us here today. Um, uh, as you saw in the agenda, we're going to spend our first um, panel focusing specifically on more of the formal electoral processes, the factors um, that, that uh, went into the, uh, the election results, perhaps. Um, and then after this, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a brief uh, break for, to refresh your tea and coffee, and then we'll have a second panel where we'll look at some of the actors outside the formal political system um, who also influenced uh, the elections, uh, the judiciary the military, um, other groups. Um, but um, for starters, um, we have a panel um, of, of experts here um, from a couple different uh, academic uh, institutions. Um, briefly, um, we have uh, Mariam Mufti from the University of Waterloo. Um, we have Sahar Shafkat at St. Mary's College, and Sarah Khan, uh, who's about to be joining Yale University. Um, and uh, I'm Colin Cookman, and I'm here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, so I think uh, initially I'm going to uh, give a, a few sort of summary uh, remarks about the election results themselves. Um, I'm assuming you're all here on a Thursday morning a month after the Pakistani election, so you're probably generally familiar with what happened and interested in this subject. but. Um, just so we're all sort of on the same page, um, we'll start with that. Uh, and then Miriam will speak a little bit more to uh, the parties and their, uh, particularly their selection of candidates, those dynamics. Um, Sahar will discuss um, the opposition um, as, it's, as it's now emerged after the elections. And Sarah will discuss um, voter participation and particularly women's voter participation. Um, and then from there, uh, we will look forward to discussion uh, amongst you all and amongst the panel um, about these issues before we shift to the second panel uh, uh, later in the morning. Um, so with that, um, so again, uh, just in, in as, as we all saw, um, the outcome of the elections was um, sort of after years in the opposition, uh, the Pakistan Tariq Yansaf uh, won a working majority uh, in the National Assembly, um, but perhaps not a commanding one. Um, they've been obliged to form coalitions with several smaller parties and independents. Um, 
I think after the last election cycle in 2013, we perhaps saw a degree of regional polarization amongst the parties. Um, and certainly, uh, there's there's still some of that in terms of the concentration of the PMLN in Punjab and the PPP in Sindh. Uh, but now the PTI um, has been able to form coalition, form governments in Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunwa and at the national level. Um, and so is perhaps uh, in a role to facilitate um, greater national policy making cohesion by virtue of the fact that it that it is uh, in some respects a national coalition party um, but I think that may also raise the potential for greater factionalization within the party now that elections are past us and to the degree to which sort of regional uh, issues um, disputes over uh, resource sharing end up becoming uh, issues for the future government um, so um, I would say, you know, generally at the national and provincial level, um, both prior to the, uh, particularly prior to the elections uh, earlier this spring, uh, we saw major fractures and shakeups within the political parties. Obviously, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's disqualification uh, and conviction was the most prominent sort of um, point of uh, friction, but um, also earlier we saw the provincial government collapse in Balochistan and uh, the fragmentation of the MQM in Karachi over several years. Um, and we'll hear more about this in the second panel, but certainly uh, the judiciary played a very active role, um, and despite a fairly restrictive media environment, there were many reports uh, of military interventions uh, behind the scenes in terms of pushing candidates uh, to perhaps defect um, from particular parties. Um, and I think we can say, uh, broadly speaking, uh, although Nawaz Sharif was the, the most prominent political uh, player to be disqualified, and, and most of the other national uh, figures were did contest the elections. Um, broadly speaking, sort of enforcement of accountability um, was selective, I think we can say, or uh, contingent, and this was not necessarily a level playing field be uh, between all parties. Um, that said, um, I would say the Election Commission and the Caretaker Administration um, did a reasonably good job in terms terms of providing information uh, about the elections up until election night itself, um, when we saw uh, the apparent breakdown of its uh, results transmission system um, and many complaints um, from the political parties that their candidate agents were barred from observing final polling station level uh, counts, um, which does raise some questions about the integrity of the reported results, which unfortunately I think we don't currently have the means of independently assessing. Um, all that said, um, taking the available data at face value, which you probably should not do, um, this was a more fragmented election uh, than previous election cycles. Um, there are a couple of different ways that can be measured, um, but I think the political science field um, often uses the measure of effective parties, which is um, basically a weighted count of uh, the number of parties contesting in a constituency, um, adjusted to sort of reflect their relative vote shares. Um, and within Pakistan, there is a lot of variation between individual constituencies and certainly between the provinces. Um, Balochistan and the former federally administered tribal areas um, are much more multi-partisan environments than uh, Punjab or previously Sindh. Um, but overall, the average number of uh, effective parties and constituencies in this election cycle was uh, 3.5 compared to 3.3 .3 in 2013 and 2.8 in 2008. Um, so generally speaking, uh, this is, this. Uh, uh, you know, in a first-past-the-post system like Pakistan, that means you, you have um, more splitting of the vote and the potential for um, uh, plurality as opposed to majority uh, candidates coming into office. Um, and uh, well, I, would, I don't think it reaches the level of statistical significance. Um, broadly speaking, a winning PTI candidate in 2018 um, did appear to be generally correlated with a more divided constituency in terms of the effective number of effective parties. Um, so if you couple this with the defections that we saw earlier in the spring, uh, particularly in South Punjab, but also elsewhere, um, I think that would be one um, 
one potential explanation for how the PTI won its victory, namely sort of splitting the opposition um, for, uh, you know, a number of factors potentially going into that, but, but that being one particular, one possible explanation. Um, Punjab shifted towards uh, much more of a two-party contest uh, in this election cycle compared to the previous. Um, the PPP was not as much of a factor, and so it was more of a PMLN versus PTI uh, race in most cases, um, and Sindh uh, in particular became much more fragmented as the dominance of the MQM in Karachi and also to some degree the PPP and the rest of Sindh um, weakened. Um, but generally speaking, uh, the PTI was the beneficiary of the disproportionalities that are part of a first-past-the-post system, um, and so it ended up winning about 42 percent of all National Assembly uh, seats that were contested on the basis of about 32 percent of the national popular uh, vote. So. Um, Races were more competitive, or at least more narrowly determined uh, this election cycle, uh, with smaller margins of victory on average. It was about 12.6 percent for all national and provincial assembly races this time, compared to about 19 percent in 2013. Um, although this might be, this would be um, sort of skewed slightly by a uh, slight decline in overall turnout and, and particularly pronounced drop in turnout uh, in Sindh. Um, that's turnout as a measure of votes recorded. So again. And the question of what those votes represent. Uh, maybe that's voters cast, maybe that's other means of controlling the particular vote measures. I, I don't know that I can definitively say one way or another. But um, the MQM collapse in Karachi, as I said, was particularly noteworthy, and this has helped uh, reshape political dynamics in Sindh and at the national level. Um, the MQM went from an average margin of victory of more than 20, more than 50 percent, um, that's the margin of victory, not the vote share, uh, in constituencies where they won in 2013 to an average margin of victory of about 10 percent in 2018, uh, and they lost about 40 percent of their combined national and provincial assembly seats uh, in the process. So previously a major swing block within the national assembly and now uh, markedly reduced. Um, the PMLN did not experience uh, quite so significant a loss, but its average margin of victory uh, in the constituencies that it did win uh, halved to around 10 percent, uh, and it contested fewer seats than the PTI nationwide and generally did poorly outside of its core constituencies in Punjab. Um, of the three major national parties, the, PT, uh, the PPP uh, had the highest average margin of victory in the constituencies where it won, and it actually picked up a few National Assembly seats uh, compared to uh, its losses in 2013. Um, but it had the lowest rate of success for its, uh, of, again, of the major three, uh, for its uh, candidates, uh, total number of contesting candidates. So again, it's, it's generally been limited to its base in Sen Province uh, for the second election cycle in a row now. Um, but um, as we've seen uh, during the presidential elections and uh, issues over leadership positions within the assemblies, uh, the PPP is now potentially positioned to replace the MQM uh, as the most important swing bloc in the new parliament to the extent to which it is able to play that role. Um, last, uh, last a uh, bit of election statistics I'll throw at you um, was uh, that this was generally a more anti-incumbent election than pre previous cycles. Um, now, there are several potential factors that can explain this. Um, uh, the electoral uh, composition changed with uh, redistricting, uh, redrawing of constituency boundaries. Um, certainly there have been changes in terms of uh, the electorate, in terms of who is registered to vote, um, and this is tracking uh, incumbency on a party basis, so candidates may have shifted from one party to another and brought supporters with them. Um, but overall, uh, there was a lower rate of party seat retention in this election compared to previous. Um, there's a tremendous amount of variation between constituencies on this, um, but in the prior election cycle, um, if your party had won a victory at a margin of victory of about 20 percent, uh, that was generally the threshold by which uh, candidates then could be assumed to uh, win election in the 2013 elections. Um, and in this election cycle, it was about 40 percent. Um, so this is, again, skewed to a considerable degree by sort of the collapse of the MQM margins in Karachi. Um, and, but uh, generally speaking, I think it suggests a potentially higher level of volatility in future elections, um, particularly given the narrower margins of victory uh, that we observed this time. 
Um, and I guess uh, since we are also looking forward um, from the elections, I think the last point I would just make is, um, you know, elections, I think, as, uh, as we all know, are not uh, not necessarily fully accepted as, as the means of adjudicating power sharing in Pakistan. So um, elections have set the stage for competition, um, but now that the assemblies are seated, we have new governments, um, we can expect uh, the parties and, and the various interest groups that uh, participate in the Pakistani political system uh, to continue uh, their competition. Um, and so I think we can potentially uh, draw some insights from the elections, but certainly the, the nature by which political competition is structured now is going to change um, as people hold new institutional powers. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, the, the last time around after its losses, uh, the PTI, uh, through a variety of uh, uh, avenues, was able to uh, continue to contest uh, for power and challenge the PMLN government. And so I think the question we'll, we'll be looking at going forward is how, uh, how the opposition, which uh, at least currently appears to be fairly divided, um, looks to sort of reassert itself going forward. But um, that would be my opening summary and turn it back to the others. Thank you, Colin, for your excellent remarks and also moderating in my absence. Uh, I apologize for being late. I did want to note before we move to Mariam that this uh, event is being webcast and is on the record. And you can also follow uh, on Twitter, hashtag USIP Pakistan. Uh, so I'll hand it over to, to Mariam. All right. So thank you. Do I have to do something yeah, with this? Yeah. All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to the USIP for organizing this event. Um, and what promises to be um, promises promises to um, to be two excellent panels on um, the Pakistani election. Now um, I'm going to switch gears. While Colin has given us a really really good overview of the electoral results, I'm going to focus a little bit more on what happened prior to the election. So I'm going to be focusing on the process of candidate selection and why is it that uh, the candidates who contested um, some of whom, uh, why some of them uh, proved to be um, successful and what that actually uh, means uh, for Pakistan going forward. Now, in 2018, some 3,400 candidates contested the National Assembly election, of which 53 percent uh, were party candidates, while the remaining 47 percent contested as independents. Now, in the Q&A, I can talk a little bit more about why it is that in Pakistan we have nearly 50 percent of the candidates being independents, um, and, so, and, and, um, and almost an equal amount being party candidates, but for now, um, I do want to make a, a quick parenthetical note about the data that I'm going to be presenting um, today. I'm using Form 47 released by the Election Commission of Pakistan um, to talk about these um, election results and also about um, the candidates um, who won. There are a number of discrepancies in Form 47, uh, so please bear that in mind and please don't take uh, the numbers that I am um, um, I'm going to be citing as, um, as being accurate. The other thing to keep in mind is that according to Article 223 of the Constitution, there are a number of seats vacant right now, which have been uh, vacated by uh, politicians who contested more than one seat uh, in Pakistan and then subsequently had to vacate uh, the other seats that they um, they won um, at the same time. So Imran Khan, for instance, contested five seats. Uh, I think he won all five, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, he had to vacate four, for for example, um, and and retain one. So please bear this in mind um, as I. Um, as I continue. Um, now, the two largest political parties in Pakistan, PTI and PMLN, um, they um, fielded, uh, PMLN fielded uh, 215 candidates, while PTI uh, fielded 244 candidates. So as Colin mentioned, PTI did field uh, more candidates in a larger number of constituencies, um, which calls into question PMLN's claim to be nationally representative. So PMLN did not contest 21% 20, of the constituencies, um, and it only won uh, seats in Punjab and KP. Uh, PTI, on the other hand, did manage to win seats in all the provinces. Uh, so from that perspective, it's interesting to note that uh, the PTI really did put its best foot forward in this election and perhaps even a better foot forward than, um, than the PMLN. Um, this election was also unique in that the Supreme Court mandated that each political party ought to reserve 5 percent of its ticket nominations for women. And Sarah is probably going to speak to this um, a little bit more later, but I do want to make a quick note here. Um, each political 
political party did more or less meet this 5% quota, which actually means just fielding 12, 12 candidates, 12 to 15 candidates, so it's not, uh, it's not a huge dent. Um, however, what's interesting is that the number of women who successfully won general seats, that number did not, in fact, change. So very quickly, quick comparison. In 2018, 175 women contested on the general seats, whereas in 2013, it was 135. Mm -hmm. um, in 2018, and this is significant, 34% of these women were independent, whereas in 2013, 55% of these women were independent. So clearly, that 5% quota helped, because the number of women actually contested on party tickets. Um, in 2018, eight women have won uh, the general seat, whereas in 2013, nine won. So actually, at the end of the day, there's no real difference in the representation, descriptive representation of women. Um, however, in uh, 2013, women did fare better because 14 women were runners-up, whereas in uh, 2018, only 10 women were runners-up. So, um, so I, I think we do need to pay attention to what's happening as far as women are concerned in the general seats, because it's important to have women equally represented um, in, in Pakistan. Now, the most interesting, I think, and um, uh, important change is that the religious political party ceded ground on the role of women in politics, and they actually fielded women on general seats for the first time. Uh, now, I don't know if this is a change in ideological rhetoric, um, and, and the reason I question it a little bit is also because the JUIF, for example, fielded women in those constituencies where other political parties were also fielding women, right? So, which basically means that they were looking for either an even playing ground for the women to participate in politics, or at least in a constituency where it was normalized for women to be present in politics. Um, so worth, uh, worth paying attention to. Now let's move to the process of candidate selection. Generally speaking, in Pakistan, um, candidates are selected at the level of the constituency by a group of members uh, constituting a parliamentary board, in the case of the PMLN, or the central um, executive committee of the party, like in the case of the PTI. Now the decisions of this electorate are supposed to be final, but we all know that the party leader actually um, has the authority to uh, change the decision or amend the decision according to their um, their own um, uh, thinking about how the candidate selection should be done. Um, all the applicants, um, the aspirants to the party ticket, are required to pay a ticket application fee. There is no consensus on what this ticket application fee is. In 2013, we know that for PMLN, it was 50,000 rupees uh, for uh, the National Assembly seat, but we also know that candidates paid up to 200,000 rupees for the for the National Assembly seat. So who knows? PTI's, uh, PTI, uh, PTI's National Assembly seat was for 27,000 rupees. Now, um, in US dollar terms, it's actually nominal amounts, but um, in Pakistan, than the fact that um, aspirants can buy their way into political power um, needs to be taken into account, and I think it's important to mention. Now, the difference between the PMLN and the PTI, as far as formal processes is concerned, is that in PMLN, um, the, the decision of the selector is final, okay? because the party leader is part of that selectorate. However, in the PTI, the selectorate is different, and then the party leader then gets to change the decision if he, in this case, Imran Khan does not like it, right? Um, so in PTI, although it's a multi-stage method of candidate selection, uh, informally we know that at the end of the day, the, the different tiers of decision making don't really matter because at the end of the day, the party leader is making the decision, which makes the candidate selection process completely exclusive. Now, this is important. If the candidate selection process is exclusive, that means the loyalty of the candidate should be to the people who selected him or her and gave them the party ticket. Right? Um, which means that candidates should be loyal to the political party. In America, where voters in the primaries nominate the candidate, the candidate usually owes their loyalty to the, to the voters directly. In Pakistan, however, the exact opposite is happening. It's exclusive candidate selection, but candidates are not necessarily loyal to the political party, as we see in the rampant party switching that goes on in Pakistan. All right? I'm going to come back to this um, towards the end. But, but, but please make note of it. Now, we assume in, in Pakistan that a political party's candidate selection strategy is to win a maximum number of seats. And that is, to a large extent, true. And that is pretty much what's happening in Pakistan as well. However, we also know that these political parties are fielding weak candidates uh, in constituencies, and that is a purposeful decision. Both PMLN and PP PTI um, uh, fielded weak candidates in constituencies for a variety of uh, reasons. For example, they needed to balance the candidate list. They needed to make sure that the provincial assembly candidate and the national assembly candidate were actually bolstering one another and were not going against each other, right? Um, political parties also sometimes need to 
to balance the voters' choice or the electorate's choice, which they are aware of through uh, their um, collect collection of intelligence at the local level, or they need to balance the ideals of the party, as might be the case in political parties like Jamaat Islami or the MQM and so on. In, two, in 2018, the most important factor in Canada's election, interestingly enough, uh, was loyalty. All right. We know that when political parties select candidates, they look at the financial viability of the candidate, the, part, uh, the candidate's uh, record as um, in, in previous office, their record in delivering, uh, delivering patronage, goods and services, and so on. That's all very well the case. But in this particular election, loyalty was a very significant factor. Now, for PMLN, loyalty has by far been the most important candidacy requirement because uh, PMLN, as we all know, has been hurt by defections in the past when, uh, when PMLQ was created uh, and has not wanted to take on many of these defectors back into the fold of the party. Um, and in 2018, in the wake of the Panama crisis, again, as Colin mentioned, PMLN found itself in a position where it had to be very careful about who it selected. So if we look at the list of individuals who won uh, on the PMLN ticket, 86 percent of the candidates had actually contested the 2013 election and then made a comeback. Uh, so as far as PMLN is concerned, we don't see very much of a turnover, right? PTI, on the other hand, had a completely different strategy going into this um, election. So loyalty was something that they did not take into account at all. And PTI was not necessarily giving party tickets to individuals who had been with the PTI uh, in the long term. In fact, Imran Khan is quoted to have said that one man cannot win the election by himself. He needs electables. To, uh, to help win the election. So in the media, we all assume that PTI's candidate selection strategy was very much to accept whoever was the strongest candidate in the constituency into the party, regardless of who the candidate was. Now, this is problematic for PTI because it went against its constitutionally mandated candidacy requirements, OK? And these are interesting. You have to have honest sources of wealth. You need to have paid your taxes consistently uh, since, since the age um, that is um, required for paying taxes in Pakistan. Uh, now, if we were to go into the asset declarations of many of the candidates who actually won on the PTI ticket, we know that that is patently not true. Okay? So PTI's candidate selection was uh, very much um, based on an electoral strategy where the party needed to win. Right, and um, and to a large extent, this um, this strategy was successful for PTI. So in uh, Punjab, it won 43 percent of the seats. 70 percent of these seats were won by electables, uh, and overall in Pakistan, 60 percent of PTI seats were won by electables. Now, who is an electable? The term electable is bandied about a lot in the media. Uh, in this particular context, the way I got these numbers was by uh, defining an electable as an individual individual whose um, individual independent support bases make them well placed to win elections and are therefore desirable candidates in this uh, particular case, I was taking into account their economic and social resources, control over land and labor, manipulation of kinship, networks, and alliances. Um, the problem in coming up with accurate numbers, like the kind that I just presented to you, is that it's very hard to distinguish an electable from a party worker. So an uh, a party worker is an individual who's been loyal to the political party and has been an activist consistently with the political party. And so to get around this particular problem, in PTI's case, um, I discounted any individual who joined Imran Khan in 1997 when PTI came into existence um, and without any political clout, but may have accumulated political clout over time. So they may actually have the appearance of an electable now, but back in 1997 they did not. So these are individuals who are genuinely party workers and have been loyal to the party as activists. So why should we care in the two minutes that I have left? <laughs> we should care about um, candidate selection because it says a lot about the nature of uh, party organization in Pakistan and the level of party party institutionalization, party system institutionalization in Pakistan. The one thing that political parties are doing is, like, and what PTI has done specifically, let's just take PTI into account um, as far as the 2018 election is concerned, relying on candidates to win the seat for the political party at the expense of the party actually establishing strong linkages with the voters themselves puts PTI in a very, very difficult position. Number one, PTI cannot rely on um, the rely on the credible commitment of any of these legislators that it has actually formed the government with, uh, which means that these individuals may not toe the party line. 
Okay, now as far as legislative voting is concerned, it doesn't matter because there's Article 63, which is the anti-defection clause in the Constitution, and for that reason, no one's going to vote against the political party. But even if they were to vote against the political party, the political party would not necessarily disqualify them or remove them from the Assembly. PTI, however, is extremely unpredictable. It has disqualified people in the past. It has gotten rid of party members who have gone against Imran Khan's wishes in KP government, and therefore <coughs> it could happen again. All right? Um, so it would be very interesting to see how uh, Imran Khan is going to enforce party discipline. The second thing, of course, is that by prioritizing candidate voter linkages as opposed to party voter linkages, we are always going to see rampant party switching prior to an election, like we saw in this particular election as well. And it's interesting to note that in 2013, two out of every five candidates switched political parties. 44% of the people who won um, uh, seats on a PTI ticket were party switchers. So uh, I think party switching uh, needs to be looked at. It also perpetuates the logic of clientelism, and this needs to be talked about in a little bit more detail and I don't have time, so I might just answer a question about this. But in the case of PTI, by uh, reinforcing candidate voter linkages, we have also undermined legislative activity, where candidates do not feel the need to be legislators in the National Assembly, but in fact be individuals who are serving their constituents who voted them into power. Um, and it reinforces that unfortunate logic of clientelism. Now, P PTI has enforced policies in KP that is changing that, and it would be interesting to see if they can actually pull it off in Punjab. It might just happen. Last of all, and this is my last and final point, which is that um, the Pakistan Tariq e Saf is going to have trouble um, as far as its cabinet is concerned. Please note that 50% of the cabinet uh, is composed of individuals from other political parties who are close allies in the election, like Sheikh Rashid, uh, for example. Uh, but mostly, it is um, individuals who have joined PTI after PTI won uh, a majority of seats in the election. So I just want to point out a few names. Um, and these are all individuals who worked in the Musharraf government, so they were all ex-PMLQ. Zubaydah Jalal, minister, um, has been appointed minister. Fahmida Mirza, ex-PPP, ex-speaker of uh, the National Assembly. Um, uh, Nur al-Haq Qadri, party switcher. Hulam Sarwar Khan, party switcher. Khusro Bakhtiyar, party switcher. So 50% of your cabinet is made up of party switchers, and I think um, this is partly due to, A, the way PTI did its candidate selection, but also PTI's willingness um, and, and desire to form a government, which I'm not questioning them on, uh, absolutely, that's why they're in the business of politics, but um, they, they find themselves in this position because of their willingness to work with partners that they are not necessarily um, ideologically um, aligned with. Um, and that comes from the candidate selection strategy, but also from the wheeling and dealing that it's had to do to form the government uh, post-election. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, we'll move to, to Saar. Let's see, I have to do this. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you also to um, USIP for the invitation and to my fellow panelists for, um, I think, what is shaping up to be a really awesome um, event and hopefully discussion. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit again um, and talk about the opposition and go uh, even further back uh, before the elections. I want to sort of take a look back at the last two terms, um, parliamentary terms, because we now actually have that, um, that data to look at um, and sort of think a little bit about what this means going forward. So I'm going to talk about um, what we sort of theoretically expect um, oppositions to behave like in a parliamentary democracy and why that's important. Um, I want to talk about how the opposition, the major opposition parties behaved in the last two parliamentary terms. And I want to end with uh, maybe a couple of predictions moving forward, even though I keep telling my students that I got out of the prediction business after the 2016 U.S. election, um, I will venture a couple of predictions. Um, so let me ta start with talking a little bit about, um, about oppositions and how sort of democratic theory generally thinks about opposition parties in a parliamentary democracy. So there's this idea that's sort of widely uh, accepted of this loyal opposition, right? that opposition parties are absolutely supposed to be critical of the government, that are supposed to challenge um, 
the ruling parties on substantive grounds, but that they're not supposed to undermine the system, that they're supposed to accept the supremacy of parliament. Um, we also have this idea that uh, opposition parties should also uh, not undermine national security. Um, so for example, in the US, we have this idea that politics, quote unquote, politics stops at water's edge. Um, and of course, that's not actually true. Politics never stops anywhere. Uh, but this sort of idea is, is deeply ingrained. Um, and so this uh, this uh, this belief that you need a robust opposition um, that is that is still loyal um, that doesn't essentially create too many waves um, is is deeply embedded and is considered vital for democratic health. Um, parliamentary democracy. Uh, is supposed to require that opposite that all major players accept the supremacy of parliament and that especially opposition parties accept that all major policy decisions will be made within the parliamentary context um, including especially the res the allocation of resources and again as I said this is not uh, this is not actually true in in reality um, anywhere really I mean certainly in Pakistan it's not true because um, foreign policy, national security policy, defense expenditures, those are all policy domains that are sort of off limits for parliamentary debate and discussion. Um, but that's not exclusive to Pakistan. We see something similar happening in the U.S. where there really is no sort of robust legislative discussion of uh, defense expenditures or foreign policy, um, for example. So the question I want to sort of raise today is uh, does it is it really all that terrible for opposition parties to um, use extra parliamentary tactics and strategies to achieve their political ends? Is it really all that destructive of uh, democratic health? And what I want to do is very briefly um, tell the story of the two sort of major political pl opposition players in the last two um, governments in Pakistan. So, um, again, I'll do. I'll try to be. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> try to be brief. Um, but the two sort of examples that I want to touch on are the PMLN, when it was the major opposition player in the PPP government, um, starting in 2008. And I want to talk a little bit about how the PMLN sort of deployed extra parliamentary uh, mobilization to achieve its ends. Um, and then I want to talk about the PTI, which was a major uh, opposition player in the last PMLN government, and the way in which it um, deployed extra parliamentary tactics. And I'm going to argue that there was a difference in the impact that the PMLN's actions had versus um, the PTI's actions. So a little bit of uh, sort of background. Um, some of you may remember um, that in uh, 2007, um, the previous uh, Musharraf dictatorial Musharraf government uh, was in power and very famously took on a clash with the judiciary, with the higher judiciary, and Pervez Musharraf ended up um, firing all judges unconstitutionally, illegally firing all judges of the higher judiciary, which set up this clash with with the judicial branch. Um, and there was this popular movement that rose up called the Lawyers Movement that basically was defending these judges and essentially the, um, the, um, the uh, independence of the judicial branch. The PMLN actually took a very, pretty strong supportive position with this stance, um, and it did this for a number of reasons. Certainly, it made sense to oppose Musharraf using any means, um, and the Musharraf government seemed vulnerable at the time for lots of reasons, and here was a popular movement that was attacking him, so absolutely, let's support it. Um, there does seem to, I mean, uh, uh, there, there seems to have been some sort of sense of sort of real, sincere uh, commitment to the independence of the judiciary as well for some PMLN folks. Um, but even as the movement was sort of picking up steam, the PMLN did not immediately jump in and was uh, pursuing tactics and strategies that were actually quite sort of limited to, to the sort of idea of parliamentary supremacy. After the elections, uh, which forced Musharraf out of power, uh, the PPP won those elections in 2008. 
I know ancient history. Um, and, uh, and yet the judges were not restored. And the PMLN kept pushing this issue, but within the confines of parliament, um, even as there was this popular movement that, that kept going. And it wasn't actually until a, a year, more than a year later, that this movement ended up um, organizing a second long march to Islamabad, um, demanding these judges to be restored. And it was only in, in, during the second march that the PMLN formally gave its blessing to this march, to this, par uh, to this extra parliamentary mobilization, um, and actually joined in. It actually, uh, in fact, mobilized its workers, its members. It sort of really threw its weight behind this. Um, the demands were ultimately accepted. And interestingly, PMLN could have, at the time, pressed forward its advantage and demanded the resignation of the PPP government, for example, uh, but it did not. In fact, it retreated to parliament after uh, these demands were met. And my, my sort of point in bringing this up is to remind ourselves that even though the party as an opposition absolutely jumped onto this popular mobilization, um, it ultimately accepted the supremacy of parliament um, and sort of remained within those confines for the remainder of the PPP term. Switching gears, um, let me talk briefly about the second example, which is that of the PTI and its uh, mobilization during the last government, during the, when PMLN was, in fact, in power. Um, so again, some of you may remember that the PTI, as soon as the elections were, had, had taken place, dim, uh, uh, alleged massive uh, voter fraud, um, and essentially argued that the elections should be null and void because in fact, the PTI had won the elections, not the PMLN, and that um, there should be a redo or something. Um, and quite famously, or perhaps infamously, uh, of course, Imran Khan um, refused to sort of acknowledge the legitimacy of parliament and would not even really spend any time there um, as an opposition party leader. And in 2014, the party ended up um, mobilizing outside parliament, again, using these extra parliamentary tactics to launch what it called an Azadi march. Again, another long march to Islamabad. Um, and this time it demanded, the, the main demands were the resignation of the PMLN government and uh, new elections. Um, and my argument is that that sort of um, popular mobilization outside parliament was actually quite damaging to parliamentary uh, legitimacy because it in fact did undermine the entire system by refusing at all to engage with it uh, and indeed calling for, um, calling for it to, to be disbanded. That brings me to a couple of uh, predictions. So, so I guess uh, let me just sort of uh, uh, sort of a bottom line that, that point. The point is extra parliamentary mobilization does not necessarily mean uh, dangers for parliamentary democracy. Um, it matters in what uh, manner that mobilization is happening and especially what kinds of demands are being alleged uh, and being called for. Um, so after this particular election, the 2018 election, um, we have the landscape changed all over again. And as Colin described really nicely, the PTI is now you know, very much in the driver's seat. It has now formed the government. Um, so a few sort of questions for us, right? Number one, the PTI and Imran Khan, which has famously sort of spurned uh, parliament's legitimacy. Um, is it going to find now, all of a sudden, that parliament is actually a place worth spending time in? And my prediction is yes. They will actually have a change of heart and realize that actually, yes, important things happen here. We should spend time here. We should engage in some kind of legislative work. And um, I think we're beginning to to see that. Um, the second uh, sort of prediction I think that also Colin maybe alluded to is uh, the role of the PPP, which actually is probably going to remain quite committed to parliamentary um, legitimacy and parliamentary supremacy because it has this opportunity to play this, this role of, uh, of a swing block. Um, and so it actually has a lot of influence now as a result. 
Um, and then the last sort of thought uh, or prediction is, are we going to continue seeing these extra parliamentary mobilizations? Are we going to see more long marches? Are we going to see more sit-ins? Are we going to see more dharnas? And yeah, I think we are. Um, and I think it's because it's clear that the conditions, right, that surround the uncertainty of institutional survival in Pakistan is sufficient that it provides incentives for oppositions to engage in extra parliamentary mobilization. It works. It worked for PTI. It worked for PMLN. And my best guess is that it will be the PMLN again, once it regroups, that will engage in something like that. Uh, but actually, a lot of the opposition actors, um, I think, are poised to engage in something like that again, um, except for the PPP. I don't think that that is going to, I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't expect them to be um, engaging in, in something like that. Um, so let me just stop there, um, and maybe we can pick up uh, in the Q&A. Thank, Thank you. And last but not least, Sarah. Um, so I'll just echo uh, all of the panelists and thanking USIP for organizing the event and thanks to all of you for coming out here on um, a Thursday morning. So um, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the gendered dimension of this election, especially how it pertains to gender gaps in participation both at the voter and candidate level. Um, and this is something that has increasingly become an important issue in Pakistan. And I'm going to say a little bit about the initiatives taken um, at a formal and institutional level to address women's underrepresentation and sort of how successful those initiatives are um, given how the 2018 election played out. So um, to start, one of the first places that a gender gap in uh, political participation manifests itself is at the level of voter registration. So if we look at the electoral rolls for 2018, um, women make up 44 percent of registered voters, which is obviously lower than um, their share in the adult voting population. Having said that, um, these numbers have increased for women by 24 percent since 2013, um, and for men by 22 percent. Um, and so the, the increase is actually a little larger for women. And this is broadly because of very targeted efforts since 2013 to close this gender registration gap. So the Electoral Commission of Pakistan set up a dedicated gender wing to work on this problem. Um, it also actually used pretty fine-grained data on registration at the census block level to target registration drives to areas with particularly low registration rates. Um, and so having this fine-grained data and being able to target efforts um, in this way is why we are sort of seeing this increase in women's registration numbers in particular. Now the gap is still large and that's mostly because we're working from a pretty sizable gap at baseline. So in order to close it, what needs to happen is sustained increases in um, this registration for women, and it needs to actually grow at a substantially higher rate than the registration level for men to achieve parity in electoral roles. Um, so moving beyond sort of the gap in registration, um, then the question becomes how does this registration translate into actual turnout on uh, election day? So when we look at levels of turnout, and um, I think Colin has sort of given us the cautionary note on how we can interpret those numbers, um, as has Mariam, um, but what we're seeing at the national level is um, about a 10 percentage point gap between um, male and female voter turnout. Um, now, this 10 percent gap masks a lot of variation that exists at the constituency level. So there are constituencies um, like the one that has the highest gap, which is a 46 percentage point difference between male and female turnout in um, the Shangla constituency in KP. Um, and then there's also sizable gaps, for instance, um, a 26 percentage point gap in one of the constituencies in Peshawar, and a 19 percentage point gap in one of the constituencies in Lahore. Um, and then there are certain constituencies where women's turnout is just a little bit higher than that of men. So there's a lot of variation underlying that national level gap of 10 percent. 
Um, in terms of sort of the institutional measures to address this gap, um, first of all, one important thing to note is that this is the first time we have numbers on gender disaggregated voter turnout at a very low level. Um, so Mariam spoke about Form 47, which are constituency level returns. Um, this is the first time that we have polling station level returns that are gender disaggregated for voter turnout. And this is huge, because um, one of the reasons why the, um, the efforts for closing the gap in registration were effective was because they could be targeted at areas with particularly high gaps. And what having this gender disaggregated data for turnout means is that future efforts to improve women's turnout can hopefully be targeted in a similar way. So I just want to note that this data is um, really important for designing interventions and policy going forward. Um, okay, so um, we have this data, and in terms of institutional measures, in the Election Act of 2017, the Election Commission um, is empowered to declare null and void the election in any constituency where women's turnout is less than 10 percent of the total turnout for the particular constituency. So this is a pretty strong signal from um, sort of the state and legislative authorities that um, women's turnout and this gender gap is an important priority. Um, however, what does this law actually mean on the ground? Um, that's a little bit of a different story, and one of the sort of criticisms about the effectiveness of this law is that it's at a constituency level rather than at a more local polling station level. Um, so what it's targeted to do is address the issue of absolute bans on women's turnout, which are a rare occurrence, but they do happen. So in the 2013 elections, um, there were particular con um, constituencies and villages, and this wasn't just in Khyber um, Pakhtunkhwa. We also saw this happening in villages in Punjab, where there was a ban on women's turnout. Um, now, these bans are sort of negotiated negotiated between political parties, um, village and tribal leaders. And um, there's something that takes place at a local level rather than a constituency level. So if we're trying to target these bans using an instrument of the law, the law really needs to be um, looking at a level that's lower than the constituency. So that's sort of one of the big criticisms about um, the ability of this law to actually address the issue of bans. Um, now, bans on turnout are not the only reason why we see gaps in turnout. Um, so there's also sort of the systematic lower level of women turning out in, um, in elections. And um, these are the... This is sort of a product of a number of constraints. So um, first of all, it's important to note that this isn't something that's just like a rural phenomenon. It exists in the urban centers, as I noted before. Um, one of Punjab, I mean, Punjab's urban center, Lahore, has a constituency with a 19 percentage point gap in male and female turnout. Um, so it's more than just sort of what you might think of as customary practices. There are certain structural constraints that are preventing women from participating participating at the same level as men. Um, and so some of the constraints that we've, um, that I've identified in joint work with um, Dr. Ali Chima, um, Dr. Shandana Momand, and Asad Liakat in a project around women's participation um, is that women are sort of systematically disengaged from politics at a number of levels that then translates into this under-participation on election day. So for instance, in surveys and focus groups, we see that women are less likely to watch political news and shows on television. They're less likely to engage in discussions about politics, both within the home and especially outside the home. Um, they're also less likely to report having been contacted by a political party worker. Um, they're less likely to know their representatives at the local level. Um, and so it's all of these sort of different facets of disengagement that are undergirding the low turnout that we see on election day. And if we're looking at trying to improve turnout, it's going to sort of take more than um, this um, 
this kind of law that empowers the Election Commission to declare an election null and void. It requires sort of engaging with some of these um, deeply seated uh, norms and structural constraints that are preventing women from participating. Um, so the law is a good signal, but it's certainly no panacea to this gender gap that we see in turnout. Um, so having said a little bit about women's participation as voters, um, I want to come back to the point that Maria made about vote about women's participation as candidates. Um, so Maria, as Maria mentioned, um, there is a law on the books for the first time that uh, stipulated that parties had to nominate 5% of um, women candidates. And um, this didn't, as she noted, result in a substantial increase in numbers of women that were actually elected. And one of the reasons uh, for this that was actually brought up by women candidates themselves were that these candidates were often um, fielded in constituencies that were uncompetitive for the party. So these women were um, nominated as candidates, but they were sort of done, it was done so in constituencies where they were set up to lose because the party wasn't competitive in those constituencies. So this is again where you see a limitation of uh, sort of a legal legal instrument without sort of deeper changes in the way parties think about women candidates as being winnable or electable. Um, so it speaks to sort of the limitations of the law when you still have uh, pretty strong stereotypes about women as candidates. Um, what I do want to note about this law, though, is that it's a really important shift in the way we think about quotas for uh, women in Pakistan. So previously, Pakistan has and, and continues to have um, reserved seats for women in both the national and provincial um, as, uh, legislatures, as well as in local government. However, um, these seats are not directly uh, elected, and so they are given out in proportion to the seats that party has won in the legislature. So what that means is that these women candidates that come on the reserve seats don't have constituencies to which they're, constituencies of voters to which they are responsive, but rather they are loyal and responsive to um, the candidates and the party leadership that appointed them for a particular reserve seat. And so um, shifting towards having a quota for women on um, party lists as candidates for general seats seats is an important and welcome change because that enables them to actually fight a general election um, and develop a constituency of voters. But of course, what needs to happen is that these women need to be um, set up to win rather than to lose by being um, given seats um, or sort of uh, being fielded as candidates in constituencies where the party can actually win, because along with their gender, of course, partisanship is one of the most important um, uh, things that voters assess candidates on. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to talk about both of these dimensions of women as voters and women as candidates more in the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you all of you so much uh, for your remarks. I, uh, before uh, we open it up to questions, I just wanted to throw a few questions out to the panel, um, and anyone feel free to take these. I think some, a, a common thread between all of your remarks is about party fragmentation, how parties are going to move forward in Pakistan, uh, given what we've seen over the last 10 years. A lot of investment has been made in, in what, by international donors, by political parties themselves, into strengthening their political parties, to strengthening their internal systems, uh, their internal voting. But the way that we've seen this election turn out with so much party switching, and as Maria mentioned, people who are not members of the party uh, being so significant parts of the cabinet, what is the future of political parties in Pakistan? How is this going to shape the next election, especially as we look towards local government elections in the next year and a half, and then uh, five years hopefully down the road, knock on wood that you know we uh, complete a five-year term. Um, will the, uh, And then I think the flip side of that is in the opposition. How strong is the opposition going to remain? There's already fragmentation within the opposition, just on two major issues in just the weeks after the election, uh, the contesting of the results, and then the fielding of presidential candidates. So. I leave it to the panel, whoever would like to take the first crack at responding. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So it's a hard question to answer for the simple reason that we we haven't seen the PTI in government perform uh, in government at the national level, at the provincial level certainly. And from the provincial level, here are the signs that I would take, um, you know, as being important for PTI moving forward as a political party, especially a party in government. Um, so one thing that it did uh, in KP while it was in uh, power was that it limited the amount of development schemes that national uh, members of the National Assembly could actually um, deliver to their constituents. And by doing that, uh, PTI legislators, yes, they were in opposition in the National Assembly and therefore were not necessarily uh, legislating in the same way as the PMLN was, but uh, what it did was that uh, PTI members who did show up to Parliament, who were not outside protesting, right. um, you know, were, 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 apart from being spoilers within, uh, within the legislative discussion, were in fact focusing on legislation, focusing on their activities in Islamabad, as opposed to being uh, um, working only for their constituents. Now, if something similar like that happens at the National Assembly level again, as, 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 as PTI moves forward, then we may actually see a slight shift in this logic of clientelism that has been operating in Pakistan, where legislators uh, are devoted to their constituencies first and foremost, and second to their um, and second to their legislative uh, activity may happen, okay? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to predict, um, because I, I do think that Punjab is a different beast. It's not the KP, it's not a smaller province. Um, and um, and they and, and PTI might not be able to implement something like this. After all, I think when, when I have interviewed candidates, a majority of them have always said that the most important part of their job is constituency service and delivering services to their constituents and not legislation. So um, I, I, I wonder, um, to, to what extent that will change. The second thing I do uh, want to make note of, simply because I study candidate selection, um, is that we can actually see a policy shift over there. Political parties can start taking these candidate selection decisions a little bit more seriously, a little bit, and, and, and to do them in a little bit more systematic a way. And if they were to do that, I think party fragmentation to a large extent can be limited. If political party leaders are serious about uh, party discipline and are serious about holding their candidates loyal to the political party, which they can, as per Article 16, they can issue show cause notices. They can uh, censure um, uh, rogue elements within the parliament. Um, you know, if parties were to do that, well, then we might actually see a change. Uh, we might actually see um, a shift away from uh, the kind of party fragmentation, kind of uh, the factionalization, factionalization that we've seen thus far. The problem there, and I'll just end with this, uh, the problem there is Pervez Allahi. I interviewed him once, uh, and I asked him, you know, there's a, there's a PMLQ forward block in uh, in the Punjab assembly uh, why are you not taking them to task and he is like look mariam in a very condescending way uh <laughs> It's like, look, Mariam, you don't understand how politics is done. I need this forward block to remain PMLQ because when the Senate election will happen, they will vote for our guy. So isn't that interesting? I mean, that's a, that, that's a kind of institutional explanation of what party leaders are thinking when they actually don't issue show cause notices to candidates who are going against uh, the party line uh, within parliament. And I think. And I think that we that we need to take that seriously. It just goes to show how effective the anti-defection clause is, and it goes to show why it is that prior to an election, uh, candidates can think of switching political parties with complete impunity. So that's that's my my take. It's a it's a very complicated question, and I wish I had more time to answer it. Um, <laughs> So I'll just say something about the opposition. I know that a lot of people bemoan that the opposition is so divided, and it's true. They sort of fell, you know, this, what was it called, the Grand Opposition Alliance. It fell apart in, I don't know, a week or something. Um, mostly because of the PPP, but I think it's because the People's Party has this, has has a lot at stake in actually re remaining engaged with the system um, and with Parliament because they have such a big share of seats uh, as an opposition player. Um, so I don't see that as a problem. I don't see the fragmentation of the opposition necessarily as a problem problem uh, moving forward. And I also find it, um, uh, one thing I'll just sort of say about the PTI, uh, well, I guess one thing I'll just say is it, I, I think that there's a little bit of an asymmetric um, sort of asymmetric behavior going on. That is, I think that the PTI, as you mentioned, right, like their, their party discipline is 
is very different mm -hmm. um, from, say, the PMLN, which seems to have enforced it much more, um, you know, more, you know, with mixed success. Um, and so what this means as the PTI moves forward as a governing coalition will be very interesting because those, some of those candidates are going to be quite happy to jump ship, and there's nothing really kind of holding them together um, in that way. I also think that because of the way that the PTI has campaigned over the last really 10 years, um, it has set itself up very, um, very strongly to, uh, to, to, has set up very strong expectations for being judged on performance legitimacy, right? Like they have really set a high bar for themselves for having, for delivering the basic sort of bread and butter things that they promise are going to be done. And again, these crazy deadlines, like 100 days, corruption is going to end, and two weeks, you know, our balance of payments will be fixed. It, all kinds, you know, repeat will go up. All kinds of uh, promises that are being that are being made. Um, and so I think for me, it'll, it's interesting to see, it'll be interesting to see how the PTI as a governing coalition responds when it's it's it fails to deliver on a lot of what it's promised. I hope it up to the. Uh, I'm happy to open up to the audience. Uh, if you would please use your mics because we are webcasting. Uh, introduce yourself and please keep your questions short, because we have only about 25, 27 minutes uh, for questions. And it, well, I think we'll take a few questions and then let the panel respond. Uh, I will let Andrew take yeah. this as my boss. Yeah, can't hold back. Just a quick one, Colin, just on the incumbency factor. I think maybe you said it and maybe I missed it, um, but you talked about the party seat incumbency, and I'm wondering if you also have candidate seat in the incumbency, to, you know, if you could just comment on the difference between those two. And then the second one, just in terms of opposition behavior, so in terms of how the PPP's calculation is, is it because they could be a swing block and get some of the goodies they want? Um, or is it a subset of that, that Zardari's worry about NAB cases and so they got them, and so therefore they're towing the line uh, to protect Zardari versus a broader party-based interest? Hi. Um, my name is Johan Charko. I am a <clears throat> PhD student at um, SOAS, the University of London. Um, my question for Colin is: um, there's, there's been some claims that the PTI has done a particularly good job in capturing new voters, um, particularly uh, young voters that have come on the roll since the 2013 elections. Um, and I'm curious to see if the, the data um, supports that. Um, my question for Mariam uh, is. Uh, about um, candidate selection, uh, do you see a difference in uh, the processes that you described at the provincial versus uh, uh, national levels? And in particular, I'm curious whether it was different in KPK, given the fact that they're an incumbent party there and they've already got sort of the, you know, they're coming from a completely different position. Um, and lastly, my question for all of the, the panelists is uh, this is the, the easy question. What do you think the, um, the effect of having now two uh, democratic transitions will be, given the fact, uh, you know, taking into account the fact that in some ways we've got representative government rather than responsible government at this point? Thanks. Um, so I can respond. So unfortunately, I have not. Uh, been able to code all the individual candidates, so I do not have uh, individual candidate incumbency, but uh, check back in a couple of months and maybe I'll have an answer for you. Um, uh, I, I think the, um, on the new voters to PTI, um, that was definitely something I heard a lot of in 2013. Um, I actually have not looked um, into exit polls uh, closely this round, whether there was any, I don't know if you've looked at that. Um, so um, I think it's an interesting question. The the under 35 share of the registered voters, um, the ECP hasn't put out detailed statistics on it, but the press reporting, it was actually slightly lower this time, uh, this cycle than last cycle in terms of percent, at least percentage of registered voters. Um, 
but I, I don't actually, I don't have good numbers on, on youth, uh, youth vote um, between the parties yet, but I believe Gallup Pakistan did work on the surveys on this previously, so that might be one, uh, one resource. Do you want um, um, and, and the only other point I'd, I'd make on the on the PPP as a swing block, I think um, I, I do think this is particularly interesting um, to watch. Um, not, I mean, uh, my answer would be it's probably from the PPP side. It's probably a mix of motivations. I think the question I would have is the degree to which the national government. Um, the PTI um, and and to to whatever extent the um, sort of judiciary and accountability organizations follow it, uh, the national government on this um, or or lead it on this, um, the degree to which they take sort of a maximalist confrontational approach towards the PPP as perhaps um, the MQM experienced after 2013, whether whether sort of the the goal is to sort of suppress the swing bloc um, and and sort of whether there's a SIND operation as there was a Karachi operation early on in this government, um, or whether it is, uh, or whether it is a more accommodational approach um, to the extent to which they, there's maybe an interest in preserving a divided opposition. Um, so I think there's there's interesting sort of strategic uh, strategic questions on both sides on how the how the the two sides of that um, uh, handle things, and I, I don't have an answer yet um, on how it will go. But certainly, um, the PT uh, the PPP um, is as of this week now facing its own joint investigation team against uh, former President Zardari. So something to watch. Um, just a couple of things to say to add uh, about the PPP. Um, I agree. I think it's super interesting, and I think part of the dynamic here is that PPP has the government in Sindh, and so has a, has sort of these you know multi-level calculations that it's making um, because it has there are ways in which it could cooperate with PTI at the provincial level that then could translate into some kind of working relationship at the national level. The corruption thing, I know a lot of people have talked about NAB and the fact that it is, in fact, investigating Zardari, but number one, um, Zardari is probably the most astute politician in Pakistan. Um, he has gotten out of more jams than, I don't know, um, <laughs> probably you face today in your, on your way in uh, the Beltway. Um, and I think second, you know, corruption is like the perpetual sort of Damocles in Pakistan. It's 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 what is over every hanging over everybody's head. And so I think that the parties have a way of operating within those constraints in a way that still allows them to maintain their um, their political interests. In other words, I'm not sure Zardari is all that troubled by it. Um, so I'll just uh, say a little bit about the effect of the democratic transitions and so what that means, especially from the voter side, right? So theoretically, the expectation of um, being held to account by election um, should change politicians' both time horizons and their incentives. Um, on the voter side, um, kind of what we saw in this election anecdotally um, was just sort of more instances of voters um, really taking their politicians to account, right? So there was this one um, particular anecdote from a politician going to his constituency and um, the voter sort of just getting really attacked by the voters and uh, and then he gets super defensive and he says, well, you know, I gave you this road and the voter responds, no, democracy gave me this road. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is like, the, it's, it's, a, it's a stylized anecdote, but I think it's sort of testament to how um, voters' expectations of their politicians are higher and the, and the ability to sort of take them to task at the elections, um, it has, it, it's, it's particularly meaningful for voters, and we sort of see this um, in the case of India as well, where there's sort of, um, you know, there's there's always talk about how there's extensive um, vote buying in certain um, in certain areas or regions or constituencies, but um, there's there's also the pushback that actually, you know, voters will sort of take the goodies from every politician and party and then vote exactly how they please at the ballot box. Um, so this sort of change in the power that the voter has um, with respect to the politician is, I think, one of the products that we can expect from repeated democratic uh, transitions. Thanks. 
on what Sarah just um, said. So on the candidate side and on the party side, um, the the effect of the uh, the two democratic transitions um, has been that I think political parties are realizing that they have to invest in their local party organizations, because unless they do that, they're always going to be reliant on uh, electable candidates. And um, I think moving forward, political parties have become conscious of the fact that they cannot actually have a majority of electable candidates as opposed to their own party people um, in parliament, because it makes um, uh, governance a lot more difficult. And I think political parties are beginning to understand this, not that they've done anything to change that uh, impression just yet. I don't think 2018 was the election for that. Maybe in another five years, maybe in another 10 years, but I think that behavior is starting to change. Um, you had a question about the difference in the processes in the provincial versus national level um, candidate selection. There's actually no difference because the selectorate's the same. Right, so it's the same body of people who actually nominate um, in, in 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 both PMLN. So PMLN, this is very interesting. PMLN's constitution actually says that there should be a provincial parliamentary board for the provincial seats and a central parliamentary board for the uh, for the national assembly seats. Um, and even though these parliamentary boards are put into place, uh, the ultimate decision is made by the central parliamentary board, uh, on which the party leader is an ex officio member, right? Whereas the chief minister is the ex officio member of the provincial parliamentary board. Chief minister, I said, because PMLN was in power when I did this candidate selection. Now, so my point being that formal processes that are written out in the Constitution are not necessarily followed. But for a party like um, MQM, it is the RAPTA committee. It's just the central uh, coordination committee of the MQM, which um, which makes the selection. And prior to this election, it was actually al Hussain, not even the RAPTA committee, right? Um, so, uh, so there is absolutely um, no difference. The PTI, however, um, in, in, in KP, yes, it was in power. And when it did its um, candidate selection, it did exactly what PMLN did. Most of its candidates are repeat candidates. So candidates which were successful in uh, 2013 were issued tickets, even though there was a lot of news about how Sharia Rafidi is not going to be given a ticket. And another candidate, I think his name was, I'm, 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 I don't, I'm, Ali Muhammad, thank you. Thank you. Ali Muhammad is not going to get a ticket. He also got his ticket eventually, right? So my point being that they, that PTI uh, went with the, the tried and tested. Um, so I, I, I don't think um, their candidate selection procedures were any different, even though constitutionally, PTI has the best candidate selection procedures. So formally, PTI is set up for success, but it, it does not follow, the, follow those procedures. So in theory, um, the more democratic it sounds like, um, potentially, the more democratic transitions we have, the fewer floor crosses we should have, because parties are incentivized to reward winners, right? Well, we're likely to see more candidate incumbency, I think, maybe. Uh, because that's what we've seen in these two elections. But I'm not 100% certain, because I, like Colin, have not actually calculated this um, figure just yet. But I think political parties will mature in their candidate selection in that they might take loyalty mm -hmm. and party affiliation a bit more seriously than they have in the past. Where, because local party organization and the wishes of the electorate will matter far more in the candidate selection decision than just the record of, de uh, record of delivering services by the candidate which has been the case for the longest time. So that might start to change. We, I mean, prediction. <laughs> None of us are in the business of prediction. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks again for putting this together. I'm so, you know, impressed by this panel. Uh, my name is Aram. I'm over at Georgetown. Uh, Georgetown. I'm in my fifth year in the PhD program there. Um, and I came back, like, I think two or three days right after the elections, and somebody accosts me in the hallway and is like, what do you feel about your elections? And I said, as a voter, I'm not really sure, but as a political scientist, I am super excited at all the data we have. <laughs> and, I, and I really, and I want to take this point seriously because we're all geeks over here. Right? This is a panel of, of, of nerds, right? And so... <laughs> I, one thing I want to say is from my own survey that we just did, voters are playing their cards really close to the chest. Um, I asked about a thousand people how they're going to vote, how they voted previously, how they're voting next time, and the one, the largest category for me was the don't know, not sure. Mm -hmm. A full 30 to 40 percent are telling me they just, and this is like a week before the election, they're still not sure how they're going to vote. Maybe they're not telling my interviewers, we give them the option of a, a secret, you know, we, we you'd hand over those electronic tabs to them and let them pick on the way they would on a ballot paper. And still there were a lot of people who did not answer, and I wonder if that came out in your kind of looking at the polling, uh, exit polls and things like that. So I think that there is, 
one lesson that I feel like we're learning is that there is a massive push for more transparency. I think, uh, as Sara really nicely pointed out, that the de jure institutions are not a panacea. We're not going to start seeing. But in some ways, they're pushing for change. This 10 percent thing might have unintended consequences down the road, which we cannot anticipate. India experimented with having um, randomized um, female uh, requirement for female leadership at the local level. And it just implemented that. Like, so I don't know how it happened. I don't know how the parties read that consequence, right? And we've, you know, read about this. But it had, you know, Esther Duflo and other people have talked about how when you force women to take that seat, the agenda shifts, decision-making shifts. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of, like, instead of saying that, look, we're not sure um, whether this 10 percent is doing enough, Sure, it's probably not, but isn't that just a case to do more and to have more of these institutions in place? And the one thing I found, and I'm wondering if you guys are seeing this as well, the party weakness is actually having the unintended consequence of making some transparency, and actually, weirdly, the bureaucracy is stronger, right? So another thing that somebody asked me is that why were constituencies redrawn in a way that actually make more sense now? They're much more rational. Provincial assembly constituencies overlap with national assembly constituencies almost perfectly for the first time, at least in Karachi. How did the MQM, the PPP, and every other stakeholder allow this to happen over their own incentive of gerrymandering? And I think the, I, the answer is they're in total disarray. So no one is strong enough to push or pull in one direction, but that's exactly how institutions develop, right? So I wonder if you could speak to some of like the long-term uh, long-term potential of what we are seeing now just in terms of institutions, the bureaucrats, the census, um, you know, we haven't spoken about that. Like, how are these things going to end up in the long term, do you, do you think? Thanks. Hi, I'm Sharyar Fazli. I'm a political analyst based in Pakistan. Uh, my question is for Sahar. Um, the elephant in the room when it comes to extra parliamentary opposition tactics is always uh, the military, whether it's acting as a umpire or in part an instigator. So I was just wondering if you had thoughts about how parties can resort to extra parliamentary tactics, even if their demands are legitimate, um, and but avoid the risk of it getting hijacked in a way that undermines civilian authority, which essentially affects everybody, and therefore uh, whether that has an impact on your assessment of the value of uh, extra parliamentary opposition. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Stuart Davis. I'm with your noisy neighbors across the street with the State Department and the Conflict and Stabilization Operations. I'm new to Pakistani politics, and I thought maybe this question from Miriam would be best. In reading before this event, I kept coming across the term uh, defections of parties. Was that brought up in the literature again and again? Obviously, that happens in all politics, including here. Yeah. Was that because it's not done in Pakistani politics? Is it a new sort of ugly, sinister turn, or is it a sign of future instability and sort of a sign of a weak parliamentary system. Why is that noted again and again? Thank you. Who wants to go first? Do you want to go first? Um, so, uh, Aram brought up a lot of good points, and um, I'll pick up on her specific point on sort of what does successful institutional design for women's representation look like, right? And um, she brought up the example of the Indian quotas, which are uh, the, the important thing to note about those is that they're A, at the local level. So these are um, at the village leadership panchayat level. Um, the second thing to note is that they are, um, they're designed in a different way from seat quotas as well as from party list quotas. They're actually reservations of a local level constituency. So what that means is that um, a, cons that a, a random set of local level constituencies is assigned to have um, a woman as the head of the village council or panchayat. And so what that means is that parties then field, can field only women candidates in that election, so it's an election of women running against women. Um, and that's something that has positive implications for a number of reasons, which is that an election of, um, of women running against women sort of builds um, 
experience for a number of women candidates. Um, having a woman directly elected has uh, means that she has then direct ties with a local level constituency. Because it's at the local level, the barriers to entry are significantly lower than they would be for a national or provincial level. Um, and so in Pakistan, I think um, what Mariam pointed out about parties recognizing the need for having um, strong local level organization is a really important one. And um, what we can sort of hope for is that there's going to be impetus for reforming the local government structure um, in, um, in this party's term. And so when there's sort of the opening for reform is also hopefully when there can be an opportunity for some of uh, these, uh, like experimenting with different types of institutional design to improve women's representation at a local level where the barriers are lower. And here sort of India's design is a really good example and something that I think can be pretty easily implemented. Um, so I, I'll stop there and let the others take up on the rest of Aram's points. <laughs> I'm just going to um, answer the question, how did parties let the gerrymandering happen? Mm -hmm. So I don't think any, anybody let anything happen, because in April, when the, when the delimitation was uh, being made public and candidates were finding out, the nature of personalized politics in Pakistan meant that candidates freaked out, right? It wasn't the political parties, it was the candidates. And I remember at that time that I could barely, could scarcely get any interviews with any of the politicians because, well, they were all at the Election Commission of Pakistan and were really, really scared to talk to me because they thought that the only questions I would have is about why they lost their constituency. Right? And that's not what I was interested in, but I mean, there was a, there was a genuine fear, I think, uh, in April and May on part of candidates, not on part of political parties. And the reason why political parties uh, let it happen, to quote you, uh, is because, well, they were relying on the candidates to win the seats. That's what the candidate selection is all about, right? Make sure you uh, select the candidate who can, um, can win the seat for you. It doesn't matter whether your local party organization has been bifurcated and, you know, is, is on one side of the river and the other one's on the other side of the river. That doesn't matter. Uh, what, what, what matters is choosing the right candidate. Now, some political parties suffered as a result of that. PMLN suffered um, as a result of that. Um, how much they suffered quantitatively, I, I can't tell you, but, um, you know, I, I think they were affected. Um, I, I also know that political parties did throw their weight behind certain individuals to make sure that they uh, got a ticket from a constituency that was not necessarily their home constituency. So, for example, in Gujranwala, Mahmood Bashir Wirk, who was a law minister um, at the federal level, the party did throw their weight behind him, and he somehow magically got elected, even though he lost his, his home base. You see, so I think it was a combination of both the party vote and the candidate vote that eventually led to the successful election of many of the repeat faces that we saw um, in, in the PMLN. Can't speak to the Karachi case as much because I don't study um, uh, since, since politics um, in, in, in the same level of detail as I study the Punjab. But um, it's, 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 it's not a question about parties. How did the candidates like I have happen, to say right? Karachi is a special case because both those parties have faced military operations against right. them, right? Absolutely. So and let's, I, that's let's, why. let's caveat that as yeah. well. And I think you're absolutely right that the party is not strong at this point. The candidates themselves were scrambling because they didn't know who was going to get absolutely. a ticket. Right? And absolutely. so there was this, but, but the point is we now have constituencies that are regularized. So we have an unintended consequence yeah. of whatever absolutely. chaos has been created. Absolutely. I, I, I don't disagree yeah. with the unintended consequence. I, I just, I just want to say uh, it, 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 it went through you're right, the bureaucracy is strong, but the political parties allow the bureaucracy to be strong. And, and we see that at the local government level, and maybe Sarah can speak to this or maybe like uh, reaffirm what I'm saying. But I do think that in many instances, especially in the Punjab, uh, the political party has turned to the bureaucracy when it didn't want to mediate itself between the union councils, the district chairman, and uh, its party at the provincial level. So you know what, the parties have made the bureaucracy stronger as well, I, at least in my opinion. Um, let me respond to Sheria's question, yeah. Um, so briefly, I think you're right. Obviously, the military is, and I alluded to this in my remarks, the military is a very important extra-parliamentary player and benefits some from some extra-parliamentary mobilizations, but not all. And I would give, again, the example of the PMLN's involvement in the lawyers' movement, which was effectively, um, you know, to sort of push back against the military's, um, ultimately against the military's influence. 
Um, I think one of the, again, I haven't looked at the data, but one of the interesting things that I see is in successive elections is the rise of the urban middle class in Pakistan and its role and its kind of influence in electoral politics. And I think that what I see long term building up is that on the one hand, this problem of the allocation of resources, the lion's share of which goes to the military, versus the other pressure that's building up, which is voters, you know, Sarab talked about this, uh, voters want things, and they are expecting that their vote is going to deliver on those things. And institutionally, this will take some time to kind of get, you know, institutionalized, regularized, all of that. But I, I, I at least sort of see these two twin pressures building up, and they are on a collision course, uh, because those demands, those needs cannot be delivered without the military's um, without the military taking a cut in resources. I think I just saw recently, for example, the Pakistani military's pensions alone are a billion U.S. dollars. Um, and all of its combined expenditures is now sort of putting the pressure on PTI to deliver austerity cuts um, in government spending, which is totally at odds with at least some of its um, electorate demanding um, demanding, you know, um, infrastructure and other kinds of things. And uh, I think it'll be a really interesting sort of, uh, you know, sort of scenario to play out. But um, yeah, I'll just I'll stop there. So to your question about um, defections, um, so I think I need to clarify. So there's a defection, which is, well, the same as floor crossing, that you you might have a certain party identity, but you vote against your party um, and support another political party in parliament. Um, but that's not the, the kind of defection that I was talking about. Yes, that has happened in the past in Pakistan, absolutely, and I'll just get to it in a second. But what I was referring to was party switching, which is that uh, right before an election, after the National Assembly has been dismissed and a caretaker government is in place, candidates change their party allegiance prior to an election. Yeah, right, right. So there's party switching and then, of course, there's defection. Now, in Pakistan, defection has a very, very long history. So in the 1990s, it was referred to as horse trading. Uh, and um, in, 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 in much the same way a jockey would trade his bet on the horses uh, to make sure that he... Okay, well, yeah, well, that would be a little harder. But um, a lota is essentially what he's referring to. A, 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 a lota is a vessel with a rounded base, so it keeps tottering, right? And uh, this is a term that is given to politicians who keep changing their party affiliations because they, well, they can't stay in one place. They keep... They keep changing their alliances. That's the best way I can explain it. But um, uh, uh, but in the 1990s, uh, uh, defection was very very common. In fact, many uh, no confidence motion was um, uh, was successfully won by the party that was uh, facing the no confidence motion because of horse trading by by making members from other political parties defect and vote um, along with it. So there is a history of that. Now because of that history and post Charter of Democracy in 2006 that was signed by Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto. Uh, um, a clause was inserted into the Constitution. It's known as the anti-defection clause, which I did refer to. And the anti-defection clause basically states that any individual who votes against their party leader or their political party in a no-confidence motion on a budget bill and, good Lord, one more thing. Oh, great. You're, you're really, like, helping me out today. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. It's like you're, like, my backup memory here. Absolutely. Constitutional. Thank you. Yes. Constitutional amendment. Um, uh, that individual would have uh, would be set to be a defector, and uh, a party leader can issue a show cause notice to said individual. Now, the, the explanation that I gave earlier was that many party leaders don't actually do that because uh, they want to keep as many of the defectors um, on their side when the Senate election comes. But that's an institutional explanation. There's other explanations for it as well. But defection, there's a long history of it in Pakistan. Uh, but party switching, that's what's particularly rampant. And that's what um, Jemaina's question was about when she uh, was talking about party fragmentation prior to an election. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this panel. Um, so <laughs> we will close it here and uh, thank all of our speakers and take a five minute break, five to seven minutes. Uh, and then please con reconvene to talk about the uh, uh, military will be one of the topics we'll be discussing along with the judiciary, religious political parties, among others. Uh, so thank you to the panel. Bring round of applause. Yeah.